it just kept going on and on and on. So here I was a person a year, a year and a half before they didn't know. And now I'm known everywhere. It just happened so fast. You know that guy, Carl Lewis? The one who could practically fly? Yeah, him. We're about to dive deep into his story. Turns out, the guy who seemed like a golden boy might have been hiding some shady stuff. Flying through the air, winning everything. But was it all sunshine and rainbows? Or was there a darker side to the story? We're talking drugs, controversy, and a whole lot of drama. Frederick Carlton Lewis. Yeah, that is a mouthful, so let's just call him Carl came bursting into life on the scene on July 1st, 1961 in Birmingham, Alabama. Can you believe that? 1961. That's like a million years ago in internet time. He spent his formative years in Willingboro, New Jersey. Now, we don't know about you, but New Jersey doesn't exactly scream track star factory to me. But hey, who are we to judge a kid's dreams, right? Apparently, young Carl had some serious speed, because by the time high school rolled around, he was already a local track legend. In 1980, Carl was all ready to take on the world stage in the Moscow Olympics, representing the good old U.S. of A. But wait for it. Drum roll, please. The U.S. boycotted the whole thing because it was being held in the Soviet Union. Carl turned out to be an outright beast on the track. Nine Olympic golds, one silver, ten world championships medals, with eight of these being gold. Can you imagine it? He ruled from 1979 to 1996 and ended his career on a high note by winning the Olympic long jump. He's one of only six athletes to win gold in the same event at four straight Olympics. He shares a super exclusive club with Al Order, the only other to do it in track and field. Talk about elite company. Now, he's the head track and field coach at the University of Houston. Seemingly the perfect fit, right? Well, hang on, there's a catch. Doping. Now, that's a whole other can of worms, isn't it? Before we dive into his doping antics, make sure to like and subscribe. And now, back to the video. And another thing I did, I just started a new professional track team. And it's not just about managing, but it's also managing, mentoring, getting, you know, trying to bring integrity back. Because that's where a sport's lost, it's integrity. Drugs are integrity. We got Fast forward to 2003. Wade Exum, who ran the Department for Drug Testing in the U.S. Olympics Committee from 1991 to 2000, dropped a bombshell. He had documents affirming that some 100 American athletes tested positive for drugs between 1988 and 2000. He claimed athletes who should have been kicked out of the Olympics managed to slip through. Before spilling the beans to Sports Illustrated, Exum had tried to use these documents to sue the USOC alleging racial discrimination, wrongful termination, and covering up the whole mess. Whoa, things were getting hot. Outraged, Exum took his case to court, but it was tossed out faster than a used tissue. Basically, the judge was telling him, Dude, where's your proof? Ouch. The USOC didn't waste any time firing back, calling Exum's claims baseless. After all, Exum was the person in charge of the drug testing program, if things went wrong, who should be blamed? Insisting that everything was done by the book, they claimed that the athletes were cleared. There you go. Another case of, he said, she said, leaving us all confused. Snap. It came out that our golden boy, Carl Lewis, was on that list of athletes Exum was talking about. According to the documents, he tested positive three times at the 1988 Olympic trials for a mix of stimulants, pseudoephedrine, ephedrine, and phenylpropanolamine. At the time, all these substances were totally legal. You could pick them up at your local drugstore. But the kicker is that they are banned in sports because they give you an edge. His levels kept rising with each test, 2 ppm, then 4 ppm and finally 6 ppm. That is quite a steep climb if you ask me. So Carl Lewis came out guns blazing, saying he totally didn't mean to take those banned substances. He laid the blame on some supplements he was taking. Guess what? Well, those test supplements turned up Ma Huang, basically the evil twin of ephedrine. It was being marketed as a weight loss miracle drug then. Well, the USOC let Carl off the hook, stating, 
Oops, our bad, you didn't know. But then, it just kept getting better. It turned out some of his buddies on the Santa Monica Track Club, Joe DeLoach and Floyd Hurd, also had the same banned stuff in their system. And you know what happened to them? That's right, they got a free pass too. So, Carl's highest level of those banned stimulants was 6 ppm. Back in 1988, that was a big no-no. Today it is almost a shrug. The rules have changed. Nowadays, you are allowed up to 10 ppm of ephedrine and 25 ppm of other stuff without raising any eyebrows. Basically, Carl's levels were way below what is considered a problem now. A medical expert even weighed in to say those levels are like taking a regular cold medicine. Doesn't sound like it would help you win any medals. So, the whole thing seems a bit fishy, doesn't it? Bigwigs at the IABAF did weigh in on the whole mess. Not long after Exum dropped his bombshell, the IABAF took a closer look at what happened at the 1988 Olympic trials. As it turns out, the USOC really did follow the rules back then, even though it might seem kind of crazy by today's standards. The IAF found eight athletes to have tested positive for low levels of ephedrine and related substances. But keep in mind that the rules were way different back in the day. After reviewing the cases, they decided the USOC handled it correctly. It's like they're saying, hey, we know this looks bad now, but trust us, it was all good back in the day. Carl himself didn't mince any words either. He admitted to the three positive tests, but maintained that it was not a big deal at that time. It was the norm, he said. Clearly, he was frustrated by it all and thought Exum was on a witch hunt. What's all the fuss about? Carl said. But after all the facts and figures were examined, the picky media wouldn't let up on Carl using stimulants. I mean, come on, of course that shouldn't spoil his legacy. In the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles, Carl Lewis entered four events with the realistic goal of winning each, thus aiming to replicate the legendary race feat Jesse Owens achieved in the same number of events at the 1936 Berlin Games. He started with an astonishing victory in the 100 meters, way in front of countryman Sam Grady. His victory in the long jump came easily for Lewis. His approach to save himself for the 200 meters and relay became controversial, however. Preserving energy, needing the least number of jumps to win a gold medal, he refused to overexert himself in such cold conditions with the possibility of injury. This decision, though tactically right, disappointed the anxious crowd who wanted to see a record-breaking attempt. But despite the boos, Lewis won the gold, and Gary Honey of Australia took silver. Lewis went on to take gold in the 200 meters, setting a new Olympic record and the third fastest time in history. He rounded off his Olympic glory by anchoring the winning 4x100 meter relay team, also in a new world record time. The strategy at the long jump may have raised a few eyebrows, but there can be no question over Lewis's quite breathtaking feat of emulating Jesse Owens' four golds. Even though Carl Lewis had pulled off the unthinkable by matching Jesse Owens' feat of winning four gold medals in the same Olympic events, the endorsement deals he expected didn't exactly flood in. The long jump controversy and his somewhat arrogant attitude didn't help with his popularity among the public and fellow athletes. Not to forget how his agent did him no favor when he started comparing him to Michael Jackson. That aloof and egotistical tag just seemed to stick. To make matters worse, rumors circulating at the time began to question Lewis's sexuality. Although he denied them, they no doubt helped kill his marketability. Certainly, his flamboyant style, including a flat-top haircut and always seeming to make some kind of bold clothing statement, only perpetuated the rumors. High jumper Dwight Stones famously quipped, It doesn't matter what Carl Lewis's sexuality is. Madison Avenue perceives him as homosexual. Before the Olympics, Coca-Cola tried to make the sprinter a very rich man indeed. However, Lewis and his agent, Joe Douglas, turned it down, confident in his post-games value. They had to regret this, for the company took it off the table after the games. Nike, despite its initial doubts over his amateur status, 
did have him under an expensive contract, though even its commitment did not go untested as Lewis's new image took a dive. As one Nike representative said, if you're a male athlete, I think the American public wants you to look macho. These statements wouldn't hold in this day and age, but such slanderous comments without a single backing would drive a normal person crazy. He kept his cool and went with it, but not Carl. Carl Lewis hung up his track spikes in 1997 and, interestingly, traded the crowd's thundering roar for the camera's silent hum. He starred in many movies and television shows, sometimes as himself, but most of the time as an active participant. He made appearances in Perfect Strangers and Speed Zone, and then later on, tried his hand at some acting until he eventually ended up on The Weakest Link. He also tried his hand at deeper parts, including playing Stu in the made-for-TV movie Atomic Twister and a role in The Last Atom. The surprising turn of events came when Lewis entered politics in the year 2011 by contesting for New Jersey State Senate as a Democrat. Well, that quite didn't go right since he was disqualified from the race, failing to meet the residency requirements. He filed a lawsuit but later removed his name from the race. Lewis went back to his roots by returning to the coaching business when he took an assistant coaching position at his old alma mater, the University of Houston. By the 2023 season, he was head coach of the program. That's it for this one. If you like track and field icons, make sure to check out our other videos too.